Well, what what uh, what keeps me up and what keeps me moving um, is is the work that I do and how it helps other people. That's really mm-hmm. that's really the key. Um, and it's it's gratifying to see people change and and just a heartbeat sometimes. Uh, just by asking a certain question or them discovering a certain things about themselves. And um, what I what I learned uh, through some reflection about 35 years ago is that, you know, the, the 80% of people that don't follow through, you kind of look at it and you go, how come that is? Why well, is it just that way? Because whatever, you know, or is there some reason behind it? And and what I discovered is there there is a reason behind it, because we all we all get programmed to be who we are, not unlike a robot, uh, in a sense. And our parents start the process of teaching us the basics of walking and talking, and you know how to swim, and so you don't drown, and how to keep your hand out of fire and cross the street, and how to put your clothes on, and how to ride a bicycle, and eventually how to drive a car, and things like that. But as we as we apply those things over and over and over, like walking, as you know, you see a child stumbling around trying to walk or talking, trying to string together words. As we apply those over and over, we perfect them and they become a, a second nature habit that we don't think about anymore. And we probably, I don't know, we may have hundreds of them, I don't know, of habits that we do that we don't think about, whether it's how you walk or, you know, a lot of different things. You know, you put your uh, I'll guarantee you if you get up in the morning and you put on a pair of pants, you put the same leg in first every single time. And you've done it all your life since you learned how to put on a pair of pants. And we do the, we do things the same way because we've been programmed to do it that way. And it's second nature, which would be, quite frankly, really hard to live your lives without that. So you wouldn't want to have right. to relearn to drive your car every time you got in it. You know, you're programmed to drive it. So, right. So I looked at that and I thought, you know, that's pretty cool. It must be stored. Those those programs must be stored pretty close to the surface of your subconscious because you don't have to think about them to access them. Then I thought, well, how do we end up where we are? And I thought, well, that's pretty simple. Um, It's called the law of cause and effect. What you believe to be true in the past that you acted on brought you where you are today. And then I thought, well, how do you even remember what you did in the past? What you what, what what actions you took? I mean, you can't remember everything. And I thought, well, you don't, but you certainly remember the highlights of the past. You remember, you know, maybe a, a beautiful vacation you took, or when you got your first kiss, or um, got your driver's license, or you you know you got married, or had a child, or you know things like that. We we remember and we'll never forget because they were emotional experiences. And the next moment changed changed everything for me. How I looked at myself and how I looked at other people. And basically, I stopped for a moment and I go, okay, we don't all just have beautiful experiences. In fact, we all have negative ones. And we don't want to feel those as a child. Some children get abandoned. Some grow up in orphanages. There's Some get abused, verbally, physically abused. Uh, some grow up in disruptive households with an alcoholic parent or a drug abuser or maybe a single parent that has to work all the time and get left alone and all kinds of situations. And the thing that a child wants is to feel happy and joyful. They don't want to feel anything negative. And so they learn to suppress it. They, they hear their parents fighting and maybe their name comes up during that time. Then they... Right. They go blame themselves for, for the for the argument, or if the name their name doesn't come up, they just hear the argument. They go run outside so they they can't hear it because they don't want to. It scares them because they think maybe their parents are going to split up and leave them or whatever. So they learn to suppress these things and make up things that kind of glosses over what happens. And you see it in children all the time. And when you when they get in school, you see it then for sure. You see them on the playground. Uh, at an early age, um, you got the bullies that hang out together, and they're they're angry uh, about how they how they were raised. Uh, you've got the the jokers that want to just prod every pe- people all the time and and tell jokes and try to be funny. Uh, they need attention. They didn't get it growing up. 
Um, you, you see little groups of people, like uh, the most popular girl in school, about six or eight girls around her. Uh, she needed attention because she didn't get it growing up. She's figured out how to be the most popular in school, so she gets it. And the rest of them needed needed attention too, so they hang around her thinking, if I can say Mary's my best friend, then she, they get attention. So we 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 gravitate and and um, you know become a part of those groups. And you've seen it, you know. You can remember when school yep. happening for sure. Are you you, know, you just described my childhood? <laughs> everybody's childhood, you know. I mean, yes. I hung out with a rough crowd. Uh, you know, the the losers. I, that's who I hung out with uh, because right. I didn't see myself as a winner back then. I was terrible in school. I made terrible grades. If I made a a D, I thought I I did really good. I skipped more school and I went. The last year I went when I dropped out in the yeah. 10th grade. Um, I skipped school. One time I just skipped a class for the whole year. Uh, just didn't go. Nobody missed me. So it was my first class in the morning. I could right. sleep in an extra hour. You know, so. Um, but what happens, though, is we take all of that into adulthood. And we take it into our business. We take it into our relationships. We take it into our health. Um, and you look at people and you go, okay, so somebody's 50 pounds overweight. Why is that? Well, maybe they've been maybe they've been programmed to eat the wrong foods. Maybe that's one thing. Maybe they've been abused and 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 they don't care about themselves. Maybe they think nobody loves me and what difference does it make? You know, they, they, mm -hmm. we come up with these belief systems that are false, but we've decided they're true for us. And and we act out our lives based upon what we believe to be true. Uh, and we'll do almost anything to prove to ourselves in the outside world that what we believe is true. We believe nobody loves me. We're going to we're going to find relationships that either you don't find one or you find one that will, uh, you know, love or pretend to love you. And three or four months later, they leave you. Um, which proves to you that nobody loves you. Uh, so, um, you know, in, uh, in the area of weight loss, for example, the weight doesn't hang on to the person. The person's hanging on to it. Uh, they're hanging on to the weight for a reason. You know, there's some reason. True. Always a reason. So when I discovered that, I thought, gosh, that's the problem with the 80% that don't follow through. And even in your 20% that follows through with certain things, they're, they're, that 20% is 80-20 as well. And the 80% right, is 80-20. Right, exactly. <laughs> Just every group is a little right. bit more of the 80-20 because there's different things in their life that they're not good at. They may be incredible at making money. You may look at somebody that's a billionaire boy. They got their act together. They got a plane. They got a boat. They got all this stuff. Are they happy? And the answer is, I would guarantee you in some area of their life, they're not. They may not be healthy, right. but maybe they are. But uh, they may not be able to keep a relationship together. You know, it, it's just, but we all have a core belief that we have about ourselves that's a blind spot. We can't see it. And it's been there since childhood. And every time you make a decision, it gets filtered through that core belief. Not mm -hmm. unlike Googling. If you Google making money, I just tried this a while back, making money, you get 3.5 billion files in, in two point, less than, less than a second. You right. Google happiness, right. almost the same thing. Three something billion files. You don't read them all, but you read the first page. So let's say that you've tried to make money, start a business, You've tried multiple times, never worked for you. So this now this year you go, my gosh, I'm starting a new business or I'm going to make more money. Or I'm going to double my income. As soon as you decide that, it's filtered through the core belief about money or about your core belief about yourself. And up pops the, the 10 times that you failed. Or it could be on the other side. That could be the 10 times you've succeeded. Um, and, and you launch off and you succeed at it. But for most people, when you look at America today, especially and probably around the world, 90, 95 percent of the people don't have enough money to to live comfortably. And it's because they don't have a relationship with money. Uh, they have a relationship with their core belief. And so 
you're already off track as soon as you filter that through. So when I discovered two things 35 years ago, number one, how do you help somebody discover what that core belief is? And number two, how do you take the emotional attachment off of it? Because just like the beautiful things that happen that in your life that you remember because of the emotional experience, all of the other stuff, all of the stuff in your brain, um, we're creating a new program right now just with us talking back and forth in your brain right. and in my brain that will forever be there. Um, so we've got probably millions, of, if not mu multiple millions of files in our brain that are just there. We may access them now and then, you know, somebody, if somebody asked me, Hey, do you, do you know how to drive a nail with a hammer? Uh, I'd say, yeah, because I'd access that program in my brain where I've driven a nail with a hammer. Have you ever hit your mm -hmm. thumb with a hammer? Yep. Get that access too. Um, but we don't think about that every day, but what we do live every day is our core belief. And that's what throws us off course. So how do you discover it? How do you take the emotional attachment off of it? Because the difference in the ones that you remember and want to reminisce about and the ones that you don't want to remember is you buried those. And that's what's keeping us stuck in different areas. Anyway, that's my... So my... you've just described 80% you of the population, if not more. Um, I know I'm... I'm having flashbacks from some of the things that you're just saying. And, uh, and it took me a long time to figure it out, but I did it by, you know, I, I was in, someone was very not kind enough to introduce me to personal development. Mm -hmm. And so then my whole, I went from reading fiction books to nonfiction books and personal development and self-help and, and such going to the seminars and seeing the speakers and such, which, you know, ultimately led me to a point of like oh <laughs> that aha moment of uh of i it, i thought it was external but it's not it's internal and then re looking at some of these things as you said that were anchored to me from the past going you know my parents continually argued and screamed about money and we weren't poor and such but they, they just could not connect on it and i do remember being huddled in the corner almost as you were describing with my my hands over my ears mm -hmm. saying please stop screaming please stop screaming so my my anchor of money was money destroys families money destroys happiness mm -hmm. and i found that i was always a hard worker i was good at making money but man, I'm telling you, I was like, no, this stuff is bad. I got rid of it as fast as I possibly could. Spend and I needed to understand, you know, yeah. yeah. And I needed to understand that. So my point is, uh, um, is how does the, the that 80%, where did they start? Yeah. Well, you know, the first, the first step is recognizing that it's inside, not outside. You know, the, 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 there's benefit to personal development, but that's self-addition. Um, but there's benefit to it. But if you only look at personal development and you learn how to set goals and you learn how to, which I don't do, by the way, I don't think it's a waste of time, but that's me. Um, you know, creating a vision board and all that stuff, you know, it's just, it's, it's, it's a dream. And dreams are in the future. They're not in the present. And okay. you only you can only operate in the present and a decision is in the present. So you've got to make a decision that's the foundation for what you want to accomplish. Otherwise, that goal is just a pipe dream. And most people don't don't accomplish what they write up on their vision boards um, because of what's inside. So it's you know, it's looking at yourself. I remember one time I, I just I'd gone through a whole many years ago, I went through. Sometimes when I, I, my marriage, my first marriage was destroyed. I did it because of my traveling and everything I was doing. I thought money was, was, was it, you know, and, right. and here I am living in this big home in Sedona, Arizona by myself, <laughs> you know, with, 
with all of the trappings of money and stuff and cars and all this stuff, but unhappy. Mm -hmm. And, and I, in one day I quit my profession. I just said, I can't do this anymore. I can't go out there and talk to people about, about, you know, doing well and being happy and all that kind of stuff. If I'm not happy, yeah, doing well, well, I'm making money, but is that all there is? Um, so that that really changed me. And I, I went off to Hawaii and spent a couple of weeks over there. And that that really changed me. I went over there for no no reason except for to get away from everything. Not think about anything. Didn't take a book. Okay. I didn't take a note paper. I didn't take a pen. I took some hiking boots and a bathing suit and a few T-shirts. And that, that was it. And, <laughs> that and it all like changed. A dream. Yeah, I mean, I hiked the North Shore of Kauai. And uh, went in my that eleven mile hike. Didn't realize how long that hike was, so I, I spent the night in a little abandoned shack of, of sorts. Halfway <laughs> through, there was a woman there doing the same thing, and we got into conversations, and and really that changed a lot for me as well. It's all in my first book, actually. Um, but when I came back, I, I remember walking through my bathroom, and I caught a glimpse of myself in the mirror. And I stopped for a moment and I looked at myself and I, I discovered that when you look deep into your own eyes, it's hard to do. It's really hard to do. And, and I kept, I look at myself and I would look away and I look at myself and look away. And finally I put my hands on the mirror and I got my face up really close and I'm going, damn it, I'm going to look at myself. <laughs> And I look right. deep into my own eyes, and it's almost like you see your own soul. It, it's amazing if you just continue to do it without looking away. And then at, once I got to that point, it just came to me. I thought, what's it like? What's it like for my participants in my seminars to listen to me? What's it like? What was it like for my wife to be married to me? What was, what's it like for my children to have a father like me? And when you ask those questions and you really want to know the answers, you'll get the answers right there. Mm -hmm. And the answers, I, I, I saw myself. I saw what I was doing wrong. And, and that's because I looked inside. I didn't look outside. You know, it's easy to right. say, well, I need another motivational seminar. I saw somebody this morning posted something on LinkedIn. They said, what I do is surround myself with motivational stuff all day long. Well, what happens if you don't have that? What happens if exactly. you, you know, what happens if you, exactly. the seminar is not there? What are you going to do? You know, what happens if somebody doesn't show up to motivate you? It, it, you got to do it yourself. Exactly. You, know, you got to look inside and realize that your natural state is, you're inspired to be happy and joyful and, and accomplish things. Um, but we've been programmed out of it, been programmed into just too many falsehoods. Get an education, get a job. You know, nothing wrong with that. It's what somebody likes. Right. Right. But boy, it, it but we've been taught wrong. So if you want to be happy, let go of the things that cause your unhappiness. You want to be successful financially, let go of the the, the uh, actions that you're taking that lead you away from that. And and trust me, they, there's plenty of them. And yeah. if you become more self-observant, not aware, but self-observant, watching yourself do things, catch yourself scrolling on Facebook and for no reason. You go, well, I'm really busy. Thanks. Well, busy doing what? A busy right. busyness is a badge of overwhelm. It's not a badge of productivity. Exactly. Yeah. Oh, that's fantastic. So, you know, how how were so many people taught wrong when when you say that? So, what what does that mean? Can we define that a little bit so people really understand? So they can look back. I mean, I I have an idea of, of where where you're coming from with that. But you know, was it when we say you're taught wrong? Was it our teachers taught us wrong, or our parents taught us wrong, or our grandparents taught us wrong? You know, well, it, how it, were we taught wrong? And how how it, how can so many people at the same time be taught wrong? 
Well, it, you know, it's um, when you look at something that you believe to be true. And, and I say that all beliefs are false until you decide they're true. But if you believe something, who taught you to believe that way? Who taught them? And who taught them? Right. You know, you yeah. can look back and see, my parents were very poor. I mean, we were poverty stricken. We didn't have electricity until I was six years old. I didn't know we didn't have electricity. Uh, but my parents were the most loving, caring parents. I never heard either one of them say anything negative about anybody. That's just the way they were. Every time my dad would leave the house, I don't care if he's going to the backyard, he kissed my mom before he left the house. And I just thought that's what all guys do, you know? So I grew up in a great atmosphere, but a poverty stricken atmosphere. And I heard the language right. in the background, not yelling and screaming, but just, we need food for the kids. Well, I don't have money for gas. I don't have money for groceries. You know, where are we going to come up with rent? Oh, I heard those things in the background. So uh, we get programmed that way. So we're, um, and, you know, if you look at, at school, when I went through school, as far as I went, I dropped out in the 10th grade, but then the ninth grade, uh, I signed up in a carpentry class and I built, we, 12 of us built a home during school. We had a two hour class in the afternoon. We built a home, 12 people plus the teacher. We cut every board by hand. We wired it. We plumbed it. We did everything. The concrete, the sidewalks, the driveway. We built the whole thing and sold it and the school made the money. Um, so it taught me a lot that, you know, today, you, I mean, my kids know how to do stuff, but I know a lot of people go, heck, I don't know, man. I, I, would, I wouldn't even know how to, you know, change a thermostat on the wall, you know, or or anything. They just don't know any of that stuff. And I think it's so critical that you, that you at least know some things like that. And today's world, things are changing so fast that by the time you get to know something, it's, it's obsolete almost. But I think early on too. I mean, I think what what we get taught in school maybe it, maybe how to you know how to manage your money, you know how to save for the future, how to you know, and we're not taught that. It's not in school. Um, so we follow our 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 parents' uh, guidelines. We follow what they do. They don't teach yep. us that. My parents certainly never taught me anything about money, except that we didn't have none. You know enough. Um, so we get programmed and we're also not taught what it takes to actually accomplish something in your life. You know, everybody's got dreams. They want to, you know, you can talk to anybody and they want more in their life. They want, they want to make more money. They want to travel. They want to have certain things. They want to feel a certain way. They want to be able to contribute to society. They want to be able to, you know, contribute to to charities and orphanages or whatever, help children. Um, but how many really are capable of doing that? It's because we haven't been taught the what's built into our, our human nature is, is accomplishment, how to accomplish things. And I learned some of that. I think my dad was probably the best entrepreneur I'd ever met, but he did it on a really small scale on a survival scale, but he was really good. Right. I learned from that. I think my mom was the most loving, caring person ever. She would give anybody anything. She would take the clothes off her back uh, if somebody needed it. And I think I picked up a little bit of both of those, you know, in my upbringing. Um, but, you know, if you want to accomplish anything in your life, there's a, there's a few traits that we have to develop. And I think these should be taught in school. Um, because, well, the foundation, for, I mentioned it earlier, the foundation for any accomplishment that you want to uh, attain is the decision behind it. You've got to make a firm decision that nothing less than that will do. Nothing. Mm -hmm. uh, because people make decisions, but they don't. It, it's a decision to give it a try. It's a decision to, right. I'll try this, and if it works out, then yeah, we'll keep going. But it's got to be a decision that doesn't allow for anything less. My first experience with that, I joined up in a direct sales company, and that was my first business venture outside of pumping gas, working in a factory. Those were my first two jobs. And uh, 
it was my dream job. <laughs> and that somebody introduced me to a direct sales company and it cost me $4,000 to get started. I had $9 and that was going to be gone by the following Friday. I lived paycheck to paycheck. I didn't know anybody anywhere that had more money than I did. Uh, and I was broke by the weekend until uh, till I got my next check. And they told me it cost $4,000. I saw the opportunity and I thought, you know, I'm going to get rich doing this. So I went to 23 banks and loan companies and filled out applications to borrow $4,000. And the 23rd one loaned it to me. And it was the last one on my list. And I almost didn't go, but I said, no, I'm going to exhaust my list because I've been turned down 22 times. And I think it was like 50% interest or some crazy amount back then, but uh, I didn't care. My training was your job is talking to people. If you talk a little, you'll learn a little. If you talk a lot, you'll learn a lot. That was my training. I said, well, how much is a lot? And the guy said 10 a day. I said, that's what I'll do. So I went and quit my job, gave a week's notice, and started talking to 10 people a day. A year later, um, made one sale in a year. Talked to 10 people every day. Didn't miss a day. 3,650 3, people, I made one sale. And I sold some other stuff. I sold my boat. I sold my pickup. I sold my camper. I sold some fishing equipment. I sold a gun and a, right. a few other things. And everything else was taken from me. Both of my cars was repoed. My furniture had been taken. My Kirby vacuum cleaner had been repoed. Sad day. <laughs> and I was looking out the window thinking, what am I going to do? I didn't know what to do. I mean, I was down and out. I had a wife and a child. And I reached in my pocket. I had 15 cents. That was it. That's all I had to my name. No food in the house. Wow. And I thought, maybe I'll go back to the factory. Then I thought, I don't even have a vehicle to get there. And my second thought was, there's no way I'll go back. I'm making this work. And I didn't know how. So I knew I needed some food for the family. And we had five days before we were out on the street. And I picked up a five-gallon container of carpet shampoo. I had a garage full of this stuff. Um, and walked three miles in the Oklahoma heat, carrying five gallons. If you've ever picked up, carried five gallons, you can make it about, maybe if you're lucky and strong enough, 100 yards without having to stop and rest. So I walked about three miles to the one customer that I sold. And I'd sold him a five-gallon container of carpet shampoo a year before. And... Walked into his office, soaking wet with sweat. And he was standing there and I said, hey, I, his name was Jim also. He said, I said, hey, Jim, I, I, I thought maybe you, you guys were probably about out of carpet shampoo. So I picked up another five gallons for you. He said, yeah, yeah. And he turned to his assistant and said, cut Jim a check for this. So I'm, I'm feeling pretty good. Well, I worked for him during the summer, picking up stuff around a, a construction site. It, it, he was the largest builder in Oklahoma City where I lived. And um, he thought I was pretty smart because I'd, I'd gone through this carpentry class and, and learned all the trades. So I kept, caught things that the carpenters and different people, uh, the, the subcontractors missed. I'd frame in a door and say, hey, they, they misframed this door, so I'd frame it in. And he'd go, wow, that saved me money, man. If we had a sheetrock with that, the door is wrong, and you know we got to tear it out and all stuff. So he thought right. I was pretty smart. They offered me an opportunity, long story short. Um, to build a 52-unit apartment complex, me to run it, me to build it, completely from ground up, which I'd never done before. Uh, they paid me $300 a week, which is more money than I'd ever earned. Uh, a car to drive, they furnished. All expenses, a three-bedroom furnished apartment. And bonus, if I finished on time, of $60,000. Actually, they gave me, they said it usually takes 14 months to build this. But if you build it in 12 months, we'll give you a $60,000 bonus. And every day you go past that, if you go to 14 months, you've lost all your bonus. You lose a thousand a day. 
He said, but if you go before that, build it before that, he said, we'll add another thousand a day. Because they didn't think I could even do it in 14 months. They figured that's what's maybe they'll I mean, I'll get five thousand dollars or something, if that. So I took the plans home. I took the job, took the plans home. My wife was excited because we had we had a vehicle, we had a three-bedroom furnished apartment. I had money uh, to start buying food, and we had everything that I needed right there. And took the plans home and looked at the plans. And I'm going, okay, there's eight buildings on this site. They gave me a list of contractors. Here's the framers. Here's the cement finishers. Here's the plumbers. I thought, hmm, I'm going to hire a different contractor for every building. So instead of building one one contractor doing all the buildings, I'll hire eight yeah. contractors. Yeah. Now, long story short, I built it in eight months from ground up. And uh, they were blown away. Plus, if I if I if I did it in twelve months, I got I got a percentage of ownership in the, in the property. So oh, I ended up with all. So that that opportunity earned me about a half a million dollars in the next twelve months. And when I got back home that first day, I get a knock on the door. It was a corporate a guy from the corporate of, of the direct sales company. He said, "I understand you're a hard worker and you're not making any money. Can we talk?" We spent two hours sitting in my floor, actually, because all my furniture was gone. Um, and he taught me what I was doing wrong and what I needed to be doing. And I, I implemented that at the same time I was building the apartment complex. And my direct sales business earned me a half a million dollars the next year. So I went from 15 cents to a millionaire in one year because I made a decision that didn't allow for turning back. Long way of telling you that, but that's what that's how you that's the decision you have to make if you want to accomplish something. You can't let anything interfere with that. Your fear, your right. all the made up stories in your mind, all your self talk, all of the other people's talk, and you've got to just take it and go. I mean, if I'd have shared that with anybody, they'd say, Yeah, you probably shouldn't take that on because you've never done it before. And well, there's a first time for everything, so I took it on, right? And so. When you make a decision, the next thing is you got to take action. And so many people put it off. They, they're getting ready to get going. They don't get going. Well, as soon as I get my business card, as soon as I get my website, as soon as I get this, or as soon as that, as soon as the kids are out of school or whatever, you got to get going. You got to take action now. And there's always something you can do. If you decide you're going to do something, there's always something you can do every day that's going to move you closer. Yeah, maybe you need a website. Maybe you need business cards. It's like I used to say, people say, do you have a business card? I mean, nope, I plan to be memorable without them. <laughs> and, and so that's a great, I don't think have that's that's great. <laughs> but, uh, so so you've got to take action. And in and, and today's world, especially today's world, when you take action, man, you got to be bold. You've got yeah. to step out there and put yourself in the spotlight. It's not the spotlight's not going to come and find you. You've got to step up and take center stage and, and make it happen. If you don't toot your own horn, you know, somebody will be tooting a horn in your ear. Uh, it'll be there. Exactly. So you've got to put yourself out there and make some noise. Um, mm -hmm. and you've got to stand out as a key person of influence in your field, whatever that is. Um, you've got to have that confidence. It's so critical. Um, so you got to be bold. And then you got to be willing to experience a little pain. Because when you change, it's painful. Yep. The you now can't have the things you want in your life without becoming somebody different. The you now mm -hmm. right. can't accomplish more and make more money without becoming somebody different. Uh, you've got to have a different mindset, a different outlook on life, a different something that's going to make you different. Otherwise, you stay right where you are because we're we're caught up in that comfort zone. And right, and so many people they want out, but they're so comfortable in their misery um, that, that they're not willing to let go of the TV remote and that bag of potato chips to um, to get out there and make something happen. And how I'm just too busy. Well, really. Right. <laughs> Doing what? So, and, but you're right though. I mean, you're, uh, I mean, on, on so many different levels, you know, people say, well, I made the decision. I said, well, what decision is that? 
you know, did you take action on it? Well, you know, as you said, not now, not yet. I'm going to, you know, and yeah. all these excuses not to take the action. I feel that the reason that they don't take the action is because they're still scared of failing. Of course. Yeah. So, Fear. You know, I don't take action because I might fail. At least I can th I can tell people what I'm doing, but you're not doing it. So well, fear is the really it's the only friction in our thought process. Right. When you think about it, because doubt is fear, worry is fear, right. lack of confidence is fear. All of those things are fear and fear is not real until you make it real. It's a made up story. Interesting, isn't it, that we we make up something in our own mind and we're afraid of our own creation. We created the fear and we're afraid of it. And we won't take action because of it. Well, what's the worst thing that could happen? What's the best thing that could happen? You know, you've got to, was, did I have a little doubt and fear and worry and with the apartment complex I was building? Yes. Did I have doubt and fear when I was talking to 10 people a day for, for a year? Yes. Um, people say, how do you handle rejection? I said, I did that already. I don't need to do it again. I did it 3,650 times. People told me no. And I just, so I don't need to go do it. I don't care if somebody rejects. You know, it's not, they're not rejecting me. They're rejecting whatever I'm presenting. And either I presented it wrong or they just didn't want it. You know, and it's so critical. It's like my, my, one of my sons when he was 10 came in my office one day and he said, he said, Dad, uh, would you buy me this? It was, called a game gear. It was one of those handheld games way back, probably 30 years ago. And and I said, how much is it? He said, $118. And I, I said, no. Well, why not? I said, I'll pay for half. He said, well, I don't have $59. I said, we'll figure it out. So he comes back a little later and he says, uh, he had a, a paper bag brown paper bag and had a heart drawn on it, colored in with red. And underneath it, it said, Mr. Britt's cookies. And I said, so what's that? And he said, well, you've had Mrs. Fields cookies before, haven't you? And I said, yeah. And he said, they're pretty good, aren't they? And I said, yeah, they're really good. He said, they're about this big, aren't they? And I said, yeah. And he said, aren't they about 75 cents? I said, yeah. And he said, well, I'm going to make mine this big. And I've looked at her recipe book, and I think I can greatly improve upon it. And I'm going to charge a buck for mine. But if somebody buys a dozen, they'll they'll pay it, only pay ten dollars. I said, "Well, that's good." I said, "So how are you going to how are you going to market that?" He said, "Well, I'm going to go out door to door and just sell them." I said, "So you're going to bake a bunch of cookies and go take them and sell them?" Oh no, I'm going to go take orders and collect the money, and then bake the cookies and deliver them because I'm not going to bake them first until they pay. And in my mind, I'm going, well, I guess he has to learn the hard way because, you know, a 10-year-old walking up to the door asking you for 10 bucks, you're probably not going to give it. Mm -hmm. Well, about an hour later, I smell cookies baking. <laughs> so I walk into the kitchen and I'm going, what are you doing? Warren? He said, baking my first dozen of cookies. And he said, and he said, I've sold actually two dozen already. So, uh, I said, uh, could, could I have one? He said, yeah, for a buck. You know, <laughs> And so he wasn't going to give me one. <laughs> so, so anyway, he built that up. The first three days, he made $180 in three days. And so one day we're leaving for to go someplace. And he said, Dad, he said, I've got one cookie I've got to deliver. And it's quite a ways down. He said, can you just take me down there, please? And I said, so I did, got in the car and he had this one cookie in a little bag and, and we, it's like two miles down there. And, and we pull up to, to the house and he goes and delivers it. And I, I said, Warren, why did you, uh, why did you sell a cookie all the way down here? He said, oh, I called on all the other houses between us and then, and here. I said, all of them? Yeah. So some of them weren't home, but he said, I marked those down. I'll catch them later. And I said, well, um, what did you think when you went up to a door and somebody somebody didn't buy from you? He said, oh, I just thought they didn't want a cookie. And I went to the next door. You know, so he wasn't experiencing any rejection. I thought he would be, but that, that's in right. my mind. 
You know? yeah. So it's interesting that as we left town, he's got money in his hands and in his pockets everywhere. He's got cash all over him. And I said, I said, Warren, how much, how much cash you got? He said, I don't know. He said, but I don't know what the big deal is about making money. And he said, it's pretty simple. I said, well, how so? He said, well, Dad, he said, you just find something that somebody wants and needs and sell it to them. Simple as that. Mind of a child. He's 10. He, he's 10. He's 10 at this time. Then when he That's was 19, amazing. he asked me if, if if I could refer him to somebody that gets to, to do a commission sales job. I want to I want to do sales on straight commission. I said, I don't know anybody right off except one guy I know in Southern California. I said, he he's in the timeshare business. But I said, that's a tough one. I said, you're selling people on, you know, timeshares and stuff. And he knew what that was. And and he said, well, can you call him and see if you can arrange an interview? So I called my friend and, and I said, would you interview my son? He's only 19. He wants to sell timeshares. And I said, he's never sold any timeshares before. But I, I said, don't hire him just because he's my son. Interviewing right. him, see if, see if you think he'll work out. He said, okay. So he called me later and he said, dad, that was a really fast interview. And I said, well, what do you mean? He said, so you're Jim Britt's son. He said, yep. Yeah. He said, you're hired. <laughs> so that was the interview. So so then they put him through a training. And then he, he told me what the training was. And I said, you know, don't tell them. And I said, I'd make a few adjustments here. And I told him a few things to do. And he said, oh, that makes a lot of sense. You know, how to relate to people, how to get on their, you know, their island a little bit and warm them up and feel good about being around you and being sincere and all this stuff. And they had about 15 old timers that sold uh, timeshares in the same same group. He was number one the first month. He made he made uh, over twenty thousand his first month, and the second month over twenty thousand. All these old timers coming to him, going, "How'd you do that? How'd you do that?" <laughs> so that's my dad. Was, but it, you know, we've been, we've been programmed wrong. You know, what people say, you know, don't do that. That's going to cost you too much, or don't you know, don't take chances, or don't you know, you know, teach our kids to step out. You know, we homeschooled our last of the four that we have. Uh, my wife homeschooled him. I shouldn't say I did. Uh, I don't know the difference between an adverb and an adjective, so I couldn't. Uh, but I taught him a class in entrepreneurship every every week for about an hour and a half. That's the best. They're all entrepreneurs. Yeah. They're all free thinkers and the entrepreneurs. Best. They hit a stump, so, a roadblock. They figure it out. So you know, part of the some of the trainings that we do is you know we we tell people that you know there are. There's a lot of you're going to have a lot of people telling you, no, don't do that and such. And and we feel that that, you know, a lot of that is done out of concern. You know, mm -hmm. a parent will say, no, don't do that because, you know, you could go broke or you could get hurt or whatever. Um, or then you have the other people who say, no, you can't do that because they're jealous that you might succeed. Mm -hmm. um, and. So do you do you classify it like that as well? Is that a lot of the a lot of the doubts that we have in, inside of us are the actually the doubts from somebody else because they failed at doing it? Yeah, it is. And it's also things that we failed at and we don't want to repeat that. Um, you know, as we move through life. Uh, I mean, I could have quit, I could have quit that direct sales company with after a year and you know, all logic aside, if I'd looked at it that way, I should have, but I didn't because I just, I think I continued out of inspiration and desperation. I was desperate to find something more than what I was doing, living paycheck to paycheck. Right. And I was inspired by the fact I saw other people doing it and I wanted to do it. But, you know, my parents never tried to program me one way or the other, but subtly you get programmed. But, but yeah, I think, uh, you know, I, I knew one guy that uh, he got he got taken for over a million dollars on a scam that was a condo project that was being built, supposedly being built in the uh, Caribbean someplace. And he lost he lost all of his money. And for the next 20 some odd years that I knew him, every time I talked to him, that's all he talked about. And he died with no money and never took action again. He was just so afraid to, to do anything. 
you know, because it, it was devastating to him. So, you know, um, you, you find people doing the exact same thing with relationships. Mm -hmm. You know, they go yeah, through well, a bad it, divorce or bad breakup and such, and then they don't trust men or women or, or um, you know, for such a long time. It's just like it's it was just that person. It's not a whole, it's not a whole, you know, a whole species of, of, of such. It's, it was just that one person. All other women, all other men aren't like that. Some are, yes. but, you know, you're, you, you're punishing yourself. You're not punishing them. And uh, they can't well, get past that. When you, when you hang on to something like that, typically what happens is you make an unconscious or even a conscious decision sometimes. You, you, let's say you go through a breakup somebody cheats on you or whatever, you go through a breakup and a divorce and then you go, I'm never going to put myself out there again and, and love any man or any woman uh, until they prove themselves to me. Well, good luck because your heart just shut down. You can't give love because you're hanging on to non-love and, and you're going to have the same thing happen again. Um, right. You take a, 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 even a better example is an abusive relationship. Uh, you have typically the man is the one doing the abusing, not always, but it's mostly um, oh, yes. you know, physical abuse. I mean, you might get verbal abuse from a woman toward a man, sometimes physical. But let's just take a, 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 a man and a woman, and the man's the abuser. They are a perfect match. They're perfect for each other. And you go, well, that's not perfect because she gets beat up all the time. Yeah, but she wants attention. And she's willing to get beat up to get the attention. And he needs control because he was out of control as a child. So he's he needs somebody to beat up so he can feel like he's in control because the average person's not going to put up with that. But somebody needing attention will. And then they right. he beats her up. And then and then he he runs off out to the bar to have more drinks. And finally, he calls her and says, honey, I'm so sorry. I, uh, I, I promise I won't do that again. Uh, you know, please don't leave me. Uh, I'm, I'm so sorry. And, and she goes, okay, um, I'll take you back. Now she's in control and he needs approval, but not the same kind, because what's going to happen in about two or three days is it's going to switch again and he's going to beat her up again. And that'll continue. And if you do leave and you don't, you break away somehow, uh, you're probably going to repeat the cycle until you understand what causes it. And I've helped a couple hundred women get out of abusive relationships um, right. simply by understanding that when you let go of your need for approval, you no longer are attracted to an abuser. So it's all about that right. core belief they have about themselves that that they were pro that was programmed into them from childhood. So how would something, um, for people listening, how would something, what's an example of how that would have been programmed into them during childhood? Well, it, it could be, um, you know, not not paying attention to them. Uh, not, you know, maybe both parents are, are working. They never get to spend a lot of time with their child. So they don't feel loved and cared for. Um, you know, parents could have problems too, and they put the kids down and, you know, go off your room. You're not supposed to be hurt anyway, or that type of stuff. And, you know, it's how they're, how they're treated. And sometimes it's, it's well-meaning, but, but yet it still can create that. Uh, I know right. one of my nephews, uh, his, his mom and dad went through a divorce and, and I didn't know it, but he blamed himself, uh, for years that they, and it wasn't anything about him. He blamed himself because of, well, he just thought it was his fault. You know, he was the oldest child and he thought it was his fault that they split up. And, you know, so we, we get programmed in a, you know, in, in, a, in a multitude of ways uh, that causes us to grow up that way. You know, we could be abused. Uh, there's, I was shocked when I, I did my first uh, two day program for the power of letting go. And, I was shocked by the number of people that had been abused. Out of about 600 people, I'd say 500 of them had, in some way, verbally, physically, sexually, um, mm -hmm. 
it, uh, I, I was blown away. I just could I just couldn't believe that it was that many people. But people yeah. go through stuff, and people get they messed do. up as a, as a result of it. And sometimes it's sometimes it's well meaning, but it still messes you up. Exactly. Yeah. Yes, yeah, it's um, absorbing I, stuff. You know, my little grandson right now he's three. And now he's at the stage of, well, what's this for? And what's this for? Well, why? Why? You know, he's at that stage. He wants to know every mm -hmm. single thing, you know. Uh, and kids are inquisitive. They want to learn. And they're, they're going to pick up whatever you teach them. Right. Whether you're consciously teaching them or not, mm -hmm. they will pick yeah. it up. They're going to watch. They're going to, As you said before, you know, your it's your actions. And, you know, where you're directing those actions. I mean, it's it's interesting where a lot of people struggle because they don't take action, but it's really more they don't take the right action because they're taking some kind of action. We, we can't help but do that. But, but kids, the they... What's that? Kid with action? Mm -hmm. Once you've decided what you want, every action you take is going to move you toward that or away from it. There's right. no gray area. No gray. It's black or white. People say, well, I want to lose weight, but I, I want to have a hamburger once a month. You know, uh, that's what you want. That's what you want. But is that taking you where you want to go? And the answer is no. Right. No, it's it's not that bad because it's only one hamburger. It's not every day. And I'm going, well, is it black or white? Which one? Is it taking you where you want to go or not? It's one right. or the other. Always. And that, that's where self-observant, uh, being self-observant of yourself comes in. Because it, once you start to do that, your life changes quickly. Once you start to let mm -hmm. go of the things that's not moving you where you want to go and, and let go of the things that make you unhappy, let go of the uh, of the, the habits that you have that keep you stuck financially. We know what they are. We, we know who we are. We just, we're not willing to admit that we're doing these things or we're not observant that we're doing them. And, and then you've got to, you've got to be willing to let go. And I see so many people that say, well, it's hard to let go I'm going. No, it's not. If I'm holding this mouse in my hand, do I need to hold it in my hand for the rest of my life? The answer is no, I can lay it down. If somebody abused you in the past, do you need to hang on to it today? The answer is no. It's not happening to you now. I had a woman in one of my classes. I'll never forget. She, uh, we we're talking about financial success in one of the topics. And she said, well, I can never be successful financially. And I said, why is that? She said, because of my father. And I said, well, what about your father? She said, well, he verbally abused me growing up from the time I can remember, two years old. He, he would push me around. He didn't like me. He'd want me around. He'd tell me, you'll never amount to anything. You'll never measure up to your siblings. As I got older, you'll never be successful at anything. You'll never make money. You'll, he said, he just beat me with that. She said, I don't know why he didn't like me, but that's what he did my whole life. And, and right. she was about four five years old. And I said, so your father's a reason you can't be financially successful. Yes. I said, okay, where's your father now? She said, well, he died about 10 years ago. I said, oh. I said, well, who's abusing you now? She said, I don't, I don't understand the question. I said, well, he's not here, so who's abusing you? She said, well, I still don't understand. I said, well, you think about it for a little bit. I came back three more times, about 20 minutes apart, to say, did you figure out who's abusing you? And finally, she goes, you mean I'm abusing me? I'm going, what do you think? I don't know. And the last time I came back, I didn't, I didn't even get very close to her. And she said, Oh my God. She said, I'm the one abusing me. She said, I'm taking on his legacy. I'm keeping him alive. I'm keeping what he did to me alive. And I worked her for about five minutes to let that go and clear that energy that she was carrying. And you could literally right. see 10 years come off of her face in five minutes. Oh, that's awesome. I mean, it just lines went off of her face. I mean, it was like the pain she was carrying and the belief that she had that she made up herself, uh, but he, but he programmed her, you know, so she came to believe that that was true. And, and last I heard, she was uh, in a business and it was doing quite well. So, so, so you what know. kind of, so when you, um, 
so you know you're you're um very adamant that it's you know the decision comes first which i agree yeah. with um so but you have people who can't make a decision or more don't want to make a decision are scared of making decisions you know because they they think that it's permanent which you know if it's the right decision it is how do they determine you know what what is the right decision so they say i want to do this i want to you know uh i want to uh, um become an author and um then they get then they kind of get into it and like oh this i don't know if this is really what i want to do and such where how do you get them to commit to something and or to make that final decision that this yes this is what you really want to do well first of all a decision can be changed if you if you get into something and find out you just don't like it for whatever reason but if it's right. a reason that you're afraid you can't do it that may not be a good reason but right. uh, uh decisions the reason the decision comes first you know if i ask somebody uh do you want to be a millionaire as an example and they say yes and so what comes first well i got to find a way to become a millionaire no you got to make a decision first because decisions come first and the answers because when you decide to do something let's say that you're you're struggling financially and you want to become a millionaire which wouldn't be a lot of money today but as an example um when the decision is made your view of the world changes and the opportunities show up, which they would never have shown up before. If you didn't decide to be a millionaire, why would you even see an opportunity? You wouldn't, because you, had, you hadn't decided. They're everywhere. Opportunities are everywhere. It's just that we don't see them because we haven't decided to have them. Um, because your view of the world changes, it's not the law of attraction that brings things to you. It's the law of creation. When you decide something, you see a way to create it. You may think it, it was attracted to you. No, it. you see it. It was already there. And um, and the view that the world, the people in the world has of you changes. So you, you change, your view changes, the view that people have of you changes. They, they're there to support you now. So, and when I, you, you mentioned a book. When I wrote my first book, and I've written 15 now my, myself, uh, on 7, 16 and 17, not, not the series that we discussed earlier, but uh, but 15 of my own books. And when I wrote my first one, I, I had it up on my this were early days. I had it up on my vision board. I had it, uh, I, I set goals every year for 10 years. And people in my events would tell me, you got to write your own story. You got to put this in a book. Well, the two things. English was my worst subject. I didn't think I could write. And my fingers had never been on a keyboard. So I couldn't type. So I told myself I could never write a book. But yet I wanted to. And I kept putting it down. But I never made the firm decision. And one day I did. I said, I'm writing that book. And I, and I'm, and I just, I'll never forget the day I said that. And then right away I'm going, well, okay. I'm not sure how to write my story because there's different characters. How do you blend those together and make sense of it? And, and I can't type. And I thought, I'll have to, have, I, I can talk. So I have to have somebody type while I talk. And so that's how I wrote my first book. And I found a woman that had attended some of my events. She really resonated with my material and, and connected with me. And then uh, she lived in Hawaii, so it wasn't hard. I went over there for about five weeks. And I talked and she typed. And we put the book together. And it wasn't complete when I left. Uh, and she would email me, because this was back in 1997. And so she'd email me. And when I'd get an email, I'm going, I don't even know how to return an email. So I had to learn to type with two fingers, like this. And sometimes I go, where's the A on the computer? You know, <laughs> and and finally I answer her email. It might take me 10 minutes to type 15 words or something. So I learned to type with these two fingers. And once I finished that book and we did the editing back and forth and finished it, 
it was an amazing book uh, and 367 pages so a pretty pretty good sized book too and and then after we finished it i'm going i can write a book and i wrote my next one 330 pages in 30 days i sat down and said i can write 10 pages a day and I'm pretty fast with these two fingers and now i've written you know 14, 14 more books with two fingers and so Fantastic. you know it, it, it was that decision that did it otherwise i'd have kept skating through going okay well i'll make a decision next year or whatever there's always a way sure. there's always a way and you'll come up with it if the decision is firm enough exactly yeah we uh we we refer to it as infinity thinking to where it's not just this and that it's this and that and that and that and that and that and that because there's so many different op options out there and yeah, uh right. but we see just that one obstacle that gets in the way and it just stops us dead and it's just mm -hmm. like no there's another way there's another way there's all kinds of paths so Jim, this has been a fantastic hour that we spent together. Um, tell people how they can get a hold of you. Um, uh, tell us about uh, the, um, the the breaking, the cracking the rich code, uh, yeah. where they can get a hold of that, because obviously you know what you're talking about. <laughs> well, uh, you can reach me at uh, uh, Jim Britt at Jim, Jim Britt uh, Jim Britt com with two T's, B-R-I-T-T. -T. Uh, that's my website. Um you can message me on there if you want, or you can message me too at support at Um Cracking the rich code is something I came up with. There's two two different uh, components of it. One is an online course that's four months long. It's a self uh, virtually created or delivered uh, coaching course that's designed to reprogram your mind regarding your relationship with money. Uh, so it, it, it's something you get every day, you know, audios, videos, different things that you that you get when when you sign up, um, something new every day and designed to just reprogram because so much so many people have been just ingrained with poverty stricken ideas or poverty stricken programs or uh, maybe not poverty stricken, but more mediocre mediocrity. And uh, so I'm helping people to break out of that. So that's it. That's at crackingtherichcode.com. Um, you can find that as a little overview there and a few videos and testimonies and things. Um, but the other one, Cracking the Rich Code, I have a book series that's now in its 15th volume. It's primarily for coaches, speakers, entrepreneurs, people looking to help others live a better life and, and um, uh, or a business to, to become better. And there's 20 co-authors in each book. So we have almost 300 in our community now. And um, it's a collaborative book called Cracking the Rich Code. It's endorsed by Tony Robbins. Uh, so if you're a speaker or a coach, well, Tony's the number one in the world. Um, and he doesn't put his name on much of anything that's not his. Uh, but Tony Tony and I have a little history together. He worked under me for when I was with uh, Jim Rohn's partner back way back. And uh, Tony, I hired him as a salesperson. So um so Tony, oh, wow. uh, a whole another interview. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, uh, Brian Tracy is a legendary. Brian's written 40 or 93 books and uh, presented to over 5 million people worldwide in about 50 years. Uh, Brian wrote the foreword for it. Uh, all the books are number one international bestsellers. Uh, you know, we do all kinds of things. We have a mastermind that goes along with it for our co-authors once a month for two hours and some brilliant Mm -hmm. have brilliant guests on. We just finished one today at Bob Berg on uh, the Go the Go Giver uh, book series. Yes, um, mm -hmm. we've had Brian Tracy and Dennis Waitley and Mark Victor Hansen and uh, just a lot of different cool people on as guests. Right. But we do a lot of interactive things and in helping people to market and overcome obstacles and share their ideas with with each other that that they're doing that's working and helping people that's stuck. To get unstuck we just mastermind and do a lot of things on there so it's very pretty cool we also interview on, on our podcast which is a live stream and goes to about eight different platforms and um but we got a lot of a lot of great benefits to it um if you're interested just you know shoot me an email i'm happy to uh send you an overview of all the details i won't go into all of that but it's a pretty cool pretty cool book um and series and an incredible group of people that you can collaborate with learn from uh, share ideas, learn, you know, 
they share ideas and and you gain from right. that. So truly a it's, it's truly a family. It really is. Uh, that's that's what I wanted to develop and it's, it's become that. They just they love helping each other. They just delight in helping each other in in the group. So anyway, I've got the, got that going on. So uh, this business got, tends to attract a lot of personality. Mentioned power of letting go. If you go to poweroflettinggo.com and just put in your name and email. Uh, I'll give you uh, lesson one and two from that. There's actually okay. 32 lessons, but I'll give you one and two that will blow you away. <laughs> all right. I'll put all these links in the comments as well. And uh, to get to everybody, get them a little head start, so give them a little taste. And so they understand, yeah. you know, it really does make a difference. And, you know, I, mean, I think personal development industry is, is, uh, is gaining a lot of traction now because now people are seeing that contrast of, of the people in front of them going, well, this is the way you were five years ago. And this is the way you are now. Maybe there is something to this. There is and, there always uh, something to it. Yeah, for sure. Exactly. All right. Decide what you want. Well, Jim, thank you so much for uh, for joining us on the show. It's really been a pleasure. Uh, we're going to get this thing put together, and then I'll send you a, a copy of it uh, when it's ready to go. Uh, uh, hit the uh, hit the road with it. So uh, we'll be should okay. be. Let's see, that, that, that I think uh, we're going to be anywhere for two to three weeks. I have to take a look at the schedule again, but uh, should be coming out pretty soon. I'll send you everything, and then we'll go from there. Okay, sounds good. I really appreciate you taking the time with us and sharing your knowledge and your experiences. Um, they are second to none. And uh, everyone, just be sure to look it up. Follow those links. There's lots of great information there. And uh, Jim is the man to go to. I mean, if you want to talk about the, if you want to talk about the roots of personal development, he's the roots. So um, <laughs> that's fantastic. Oh, thanks a lot. I appreciate that. All right, you take care. Yeah. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.